I guess in the chat, I was wondering if you guys could just put in when you think sectional controversy and civil war became inevitable in the United States, or what date or what event really set the country on the road to civil war. And as you guys type that in, I that question really leads me to the main question that I am going to talk about today, which is what role slavery played in pushing Texas and the rest of the United States to civil war. And for me, the really important event that really destabilizes section or that leads to sectional controversy is the US-Mexican War. And I'm gonna to argue today that the US-Mexican War is really central to understanding what, or that it is important because it upset the political balance between the North and the South. And I'm gonna argue, and, and over the course of answering that, we're gonna be looking at how, um, we're gonna be identifying the US-Mexican War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the Compromise of 1850, all parts of Teague's 7.4C. And I'm going to argue that we can really understand that cascade of events in the 1850s, which can just seem like event after event that is leading towards sectional controversy, that all of those events, or most of them at least, we can understand as the attempts of Southern whites and their allies to try to restore that sectional balance. And of course, in that part of the talk, we're really gonna be emphasizing the expansion of slavery and its importance to Texas's ultimate decision to secede from the union. So Dr. Torgett left us off last week with the annexation of Texas, right at the end of John Tyler's administration. When James K. Polk assumes the White House, he is determined to make good on his campaign promise to pursue the United States' quote unquote manifest destiny to extend the course of US empire both to the North and to the South. And to that end, he sent instructions to General Zachary Taylor in the fall of 1845 to move his troops from Corpus Christi to the mouth of the Rio Grande into the heart of the disputed Nueces Strip. Dr. Torgett was talking last week about how the Republic of Texas and then the United States claimed the Rio Grande as the border uh, with Mexico, while Mexico claimed with good reason that the border was in fact the Nueces River. On April 25th, 1846, a force of several hundred Mexican soldiers attacked a reconnaissance party about 15 miles upstream from what is now Brownsville, Texas. The war had begun. And as that news of the war was transported across the United States, Americans rallied behind their nation. And we can really see that enthusiasm for the war in this painting by Richard Caden Woodville, News from Mexico. And it's a really good painting to show with your students because you can see that half dozen uh, white men on the stoop of a hotel reading the news that they were able to get so quickly thanks to transformations in um, printing technology as well as transportation. But even in this painting, which portrays that enthusiasm for the war, we can also see a sense of foreboding. At the top of the image, oops, we have problem. the image up. I don't know if we've advanced. So now you can see these uh, white men sharing the news of, from Mexico enthusiastically. But at the top of the painting, you can see the sign of the American Hotel. Um, it's probably not as clear on your screen as it is in the actual painting, but if you pull up the image of the painting, it should, you can zoom in on that. It's the American Hotel, but the word American is cut into as is the eagle that is on that sign. And it really is showing the ways in which the news from Mexico is seen as a threat to the integrity of the Union. And the reason that the Mexican-American War is posing this threat to the Union, we can kind of get a sense of from the two African-Americans in the bottom right-hand corner, perhaps a father and a son who are also listening to the news from Mexico, presumably because they are interested to hear what this war is going to mean for the future of slavery. Slide. Uh, you can press it again, thank you. And this question of the status of slavery in whatever territories are gonna be conquered over the course of the war is going to come onto the floor of the Senate on August 8th, 1846, when a freshman representative from Pennsylvania named David Wilmot 
proposes an amendment to an appropriation bill to fund the war that would prohibit slavery in all of the territories conquered as a result of that war. Historians have argued that this is the event in US history that leads almost inevitably to sectional controversy and civil war. But it remains something of a puzzle because David Wilmot was a Democrat. And in 1846, the Democratic Party stood for a Jeffersonian ideal of limited government. They were opposed to federal funding for internal improvements, the 19th century term for infrastructure. They were opposed to a national bank and they were opposed to federal interference with respect to slavery. So much so that David Wilmot was one of the Northern Democrats who voted in favor of the annexation of Texas as a slave state in 1845, along with many other Democrats. And so it's really surprising that a year later, he's proposing an amendment to prohibit slavery from the conquered Mexican territories. So why is Wilmot doing this? What can account for this political 180? Historians have proposed a couple of explanations for why that might be, but really none are as convincing, I think, as the explanation that David Wilmot himself gave. And his explanation goes something like this. He accepted the Democrats' contention that the federal government had no power under the Constitution to interfere with slavery where it existed. And it was for that reason, he claimed, that he had voted for the annexation of Texas as a free state because, quote, slavery had already been established there, close quote. And the Constitution didn't tell the Congress that it could interfere with slavery where it existed. But if the federal government lacked the power to abolish slavery where it existed, as in Texas, then it also lacked the power to establish slavery where it had been abolished. And David Wilmot knew that the Mexican government had abolished slavery in 1837. And so he argued that any land ceded to the United States as a result of the war would enter the Union as free territories. Now, historians have tried to explain what they saw as a political 180, but David Wilmot argued that he was in fact upholding democratic principles to quote unquote, let slavery alone. Slide. Southern congressmen were up in arms, and you could just press again, thank you, were up in arms about this proviso. And the reason is that it threatened to upset the balance of power between North and South. In 1846, there are 15 free states and 15 slave states. And if the conquered Mexican territories were organized as free territories, then basically all of the remaining Western territories are gonna be closed to slavery. The Oregon territory, slavery is prohibited. And then in the remaining territories of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, slavery is prohibited north of 3630 under the terms of the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which we will be returning to later in the talk. Uh, slide. Southern politicians did not want to face this reality. This is what they were afraid of. And so they blustered that Mexico could not possibly have abolished slavery. And that led Northern congressmen and even some non-Northern congressmen to read Mexico's laws on the floors of the Senate. And one of those congressmen was Senator Thomas Hart Benton from Missouri, a slave state, slide please. He read Mexico's laws in the original Spanish on the floor of the Senate, but he actually saw Mexico's laws as a way out of the sectional controversy that the Wilmot Proviso had provoked. And to explain exactly why that is, let's look at what he says here. You can uh, slide again, please. Benton argued that if Mexico had abolished slavery and Congress had no power to overturn those laws, then slavery couldn't exist in that territory and that the Wilmot Proviso was redundant. It was unnecessary, or if anything, it was just a, a, an, act, an antic brought by the Northern Democrats to you know, stoke sectional controversy. Slide, please. And this argument, the argument that the Wilmot Proviso was redundant convinced other Northern Democrats like Richard Broadhead of Pennsylvania, who said, quote, if the territory will be free when it is annexed and Congress has no power to make it slave, where is the necessity for the adoption of the amendment? Uh, slide, please. And he wasn't the only one. James W. Bradbury of Maine also claimed that the proviso is now there prohibiting slavery throughout their entire extent. They didn't need to pass the Wilmot proviso. 
And so in 1847, the proviso was voted down, slide please. And a year later, on February 2nd, 1848, representatives of the United States and Mexico signed the treaty that ended the US-Mexican War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In the, in the treaty, the Mexican government recognized the independence of Texas, accepted the Rio Grande as the border, and ceded its territories of Nuevo Mexico and Alta California, California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, parts of Colorado, for a mere $15 million. But the status of slavery in those territories really was still very contentious because Northerners and Southerners had very different ideas of what they had decided when they rejected the Wilma Proviso. Northerners believed that slavery could not extend to the former Mexican territories because human bondage had already been abolished there and Congress hadn't reestablished it. But Southern whites believed that while Congress could not overturn Mexican laws, the territories when admitted as states had the unquestioned right to amend previous legislation, including laws relating to slavery. And this idea that the people of the territories should get to decide the status of slavery was known as popular sovereignty. This misunderstanding between Northerners and Southerners about what they had actually decided might have just lain dormant if not for the discovery of gold at Southerners Mill in California in 1848 and the influx of people to California such that by 1849, slide please, California had petitioned for admission as a state and a free state at that. This provoked extreme sectional controversy because it would mean 16 non-slaveholding states and 15 slaveholding states. And to put an end to that sectional controversy slide, you might have to click a couple times here. Um, Senator Henry Clay of Massachusetts proposed the Compromise of 1850, which had five parts. Slide. First, it was going to admit California as a free state without restriction. So the people had the authority to decide the status of slavery. Second, it was going to organize the territorial governments for New Mexico and Utah without provision on slavery. And it refrained from doing so because in Clay's own words, quote, slavery does not exist by law in any of the territory acquired by the United States from the Republic of Mexico. That same idea that David Wilmot had first proposed in 1846. The compromise also ends the slave trade in the District of Columbia, longtime goal of abolitionists. And most importantly for Southerners, it passes a more effective, a really draconian fugitive slave law that's gonna uh, secure the property of slaveholders in the Southern states. And finally, Texas accepts what is now its current boundary with New Mexico in exchange for the federal government assuming $10 million of its debt. Again, what Dr. Torgett was talking about last week, the importance of the debt of the Republic of Texas, we still are seeing that debt here in 1850. Slide, please. Southern politicians, really only had to look at a map to realize what this compromise meant for the sectional balance in the United States. The admission of California tilted the balance of power in favor of the North, and there was no guarantee that the remaining territories would enter the Union as slave states. And Southern politicians spent the next decade trying to avert the loss of power that the US-Mexico War set into motion. Slide. So in the chat, I would be curious to hear how you think Southern whites we're thinking that they might be able to add more slave states to the union. What foreign territories could they try to add? What non-slave holding territories could they try to open to slavery? If you look at this map, you can see that, you know, they, they could try to bring over those former Mexican territories. And they did try to do that by building a railroad from Texas to California, which they hoped would at least bind those territories to Southern interests, even if they had doubts about whether slavery could actually take root in places like Arizona and New Mexico. Another way that they attempted to add a slave state to the Union was by attempting to annex Cuba, which failed in 1854, but was, was, would have been a good solution because Cuba had slavery and would have been admitted um, under democratic principles of non-interference as a slave state. One of the ways in which Southerners most successfully uh, tried to rebalance or restore the balance of power was through the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Slide, please. On January 23rd, 1854, Stephen F. Douglas of Illinois proposed to organize the Kansas and Nebraska territories without any prohibition on slavery. He wanted to open them up to popular sovereignty, even though 
the Missouri Compromise had previously promised to close those territories to slavery. Northerners were outraged, slide. They believed that the Missouri Compromise was a sacred compact and they weren't the only ones who argued that. Sam Houston of Texas, who was then a center, senator also was opposed to rescinding the Missouri Compromise. I mean, it was kind of unfair that they admitted Missouri as a slave state in exchange for this prohibition of slavery in these territories. And then when it was time to organize those territories, uh, the Southerners were reneging on their argument. Um, this or position that Houston took was not popular in Texas and he ultimately lost his reelection campaign as a result of this, uh, his, his vote against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Slide, please. Stephen Douglas tried to reassure all of the doubters that the doctrine of popular sovereignty would have no effect on the status of slavery in those territories because he claimed that slaveholders would never risk bringing enslaved people to territories that didn't have explicit laws protecting slavery. In other words, he was saying that they could change this and appease Southerners without actually expanding slavery. All of, the, all of you who have taught Bleeding Kansas know that this was not a true promise, but it was a promise he was trying to make. And it succeeded. On May 22nd, 1854, the House of Representatives um, passed Douglas's bill, 113 to 110, these razor thin margins. Um, and this was not a popular decision. Of the 45 Northern Democrats who had voted for the Kansas-Nebraska Act, only seven were uh, were reelected in the next um, in the next election, which is a pretty strong uh, rejection by their constituencies about this particular act. Um, slide, please. And this act is really going to galvanize opposition, not just to Democrats, but particularly to the Kansas Nebraska Act. And it's going to take the form of the Republican Party, whose entire purpose is to overturn the Kansas Nebraska Act and stop the expansion of slavery to places where it does not exist. And it, it uh, creates this coalition of abolitionists, nativists, free soilers, Northern Whigs, and Northern Democrats that is really threatening to um, Democrats and particularly Southern Democrats. So Southern efforts to restore the sectional balance have stoked tremendous sectional controversy. Um, slide please. Violence has broken out in Kansas as slaveholders and free staters battled for control of the territory. Slide. On May 22nd, 1856, Rep Representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina caned Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts for a speech he had given railing against the violence in Kansas. You can see this Winslow Homer print, which shows the, the senators who watched this happen without doing anything. And in the midst of all of this controversy, the one hope that perhaps they could tampen down on this sectional controversy was for the Supreme Court to issue a decision that would put to rest these questions once and for all, slide. And that court decision came on March 6, 1857, when Chief Judge Justice Roger Taney delivered the majority opinion in the Dred Scott case. The plaintiff was an enslaved man named Dred Scott who sued for his freedom in Missouri on the grounds that he had lived with his master, John Sanford, in the Wisconsin Territory, as well as the free state of Illinois. And you can see where he lived at Fort Snelling and Fort St. Armstrong on that map there. Slide. The Dred Scott decision raised, or the Dred Scott case raised three different questions. The first was, did Dred Scott, as an African American, have the right to sue in federal court? Chief Justice Roger Taney answered no, African Americans were not citizens, they could not sue in federal court. And that should have ended the case right there because Taney basically admitted that the Supreme Court didn't have jurisdiction over this case, Dred Scott shouldn't have been able to bring it in the first place. But because there was this desire for the Supreme Court to settle these questions, Taney decided to rule on the other two questions that the Dred Scott case raised. The second question was, did Scott's residence on free school entitle him to freedom? Tawny again answered no, which is pretty remarkable because it seemed to open the door for slaveholders to take their enslaved people to free states and territories for any length of time and still re retain control over those enslaved people. The third question was, 
did Congress have the right to determine or to prohibit slavery in the territories? Was the Missouri Compromise prohibition of slavery north of 3630 constitutional? And Taney answers again in the negative. And he says that any act of Congress that deprives a citizen of his property without due process is a violation of the Fifth Amendment protections for property. This is slaveholders' best outcome here but it's not going to resolve the problem. And it's gonna pose a particular problem for the Democratic Party, because if Congress did not have the right to prohibit slavery in the territories, then there was this question of whether the territorial legislatures could prohibit slavery in the territories. If that was a violation of the Fifth Amendment, they probably couldn't. And if the territorial legislatures couldn't prohibit slavery, then popular sovereignty was really an empty promise. It basically meant that territorial legislatures could not make any effort or couldn't pass any legislation against slavery. Stephen Douglas, who is the figurehead of popular sovereignty, uh, responds to this by saying that, yeah, it might be true that we can't prohibit slavery explicitly, but he argues that if territorial legislatures don't pass explicit laws protecting slavery, that they will basically be prohibiting it in, in practice, even if it's not by law. This posture, which he calls the Freeport Doctrine, alienates many Southern, um, and Southern slaveholders, Southern whites, who start to think that popular sovereignty is not going to be the ticket to restoring the sectional balance in the United States. Slide. So the Dred Scott decision does not resolve the sectional, it doesn't restore um, sectional peace. The balance of power remains out of whack. And even worse is the fact that in slave, the property of slaveholders in the slaveholding states seems to be insecure because despite the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, enslaved people are still escaping and they're receiving help. And here are just a couple of examples of famous fugitive slaves who escaped to the North. And it's not just enslaved people escaping to the North. Slide, please. Mexico had abolished slavery in 1837 and 1857. They passed a constitution that promised freedom to all enslaved people from the moment they set foot on Mexican soil. The opposite decision as Judge Tawney reached in the Dred Scott decision. And this is leading uh, to even more enslaved people escaping to Mexico from Texas. And Texas slaveholders are up in arms about this. In 1858, 500 Texans uh, send this petition to Congress. You can see on the right here where they slide. Um, are railing against Mexico's constitution as an indirect robbery of the slave property of Texas that was um, endangering the lives of their citizens. So there's this feeling that slavery is under a serious threat, not just from the North, but also from the South. And the fears about this, um, or of threats to slavery are only going to increase in the election of 1860. Uh, slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the fears of the Texas slaveholders are, are really well shown in this census from Brownsville in 1860, where you can see there are only seven enslaved people in the town, which is pretty small. And it really goes to show that the fear of slaveholders to bring their enslaved people anywhere near Mexico where they can escape. And that, was, that fear was very credible because in column six, we see listed the number of fugitives from the state. And if you count them, you see that there are four fugitives from the state of the seven enslaved people who are listed on that census. So more than half of them are gone, not good for slaveholders in Texas. And they're gonna just be even more concerned when uh, the election of 1860 takes place, slide. The Republicans are going to nominate Abraham Lincoln, whose platform is to prohibit the expansion of slavery while enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act, protecting slave, slave, um, slave property where it exists under the terms of the Constitution. The Democratic Party is going to split in two. Stephen Douglas, who is going to argue for popular sovereignty, and John Breckinridge, who instead is going to argue that we needed a federal slave code in the territories to help protect enslaved property. 
the division of the Democratic Party makes it all the more likely that the Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln will win. And in an attempt to forestall such a, a, a possibility, the Constitu Constitutional Union Party is organized, nominates John Bell, and they try to create a coalition around the vaguest of principles, defense of the union and enforcement of the law. Who could, who could disagree with that? But that doesn't work. John Bell is not able to forge a coalition to defeat Abraham Lincoln, slide please. And as a result of that, Abraham Lincoln carries the Electoral College with 180 votes. Uh, he's obviously only taking, he's only winning non-slaveholding states. His name is not even on the ballot in many Southern states. And Lincoln's election is problematic because his promise to prohibit the expansion of slavery closes off any hope that Southern slaveholding interests had of adding more slaveholding states to the Union and restoring the balance of power that had been put out of whack by the US war with Mexico. To avoid that loss of power, the Southern states, beginning with South Carolina, secede. And by February 2nd, 1861, seven states had seceded from the Union, including Texas. By the end of that spring, the number of seceded states is going to number 11, and they're gonna form the Confederacy against which the Union will fight the Civil War. I am now very happy to answer some questions.